This episode is brought to you by StoryWorth. Visit storyworth.com slash Lisa to get $20 off when you subscribe. That's storyworth.com slash Lisa. Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 218. This episode, I think we're going to devote in large part to you, your questions and your comments. Of course, that's one of the great things about doing this podcast is I get to hear from you and kind of find out what you are working on. Let's see if we can't solve some problems and certainly learn from each other as you share what's working for you and maybe something that you've applied that you've heard here on the podcast. That's always a big benefit of doing a show like this. And I love hearing from you. Of course, you can always reach me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. And you can always leave a voicemail at our voicemail line, 925-272-4021. So even though we do have some specific questions, I think what you're going to find is that there are universal ideas here that we can all benefit from. And some of the hot topics that have been on your mind lately are checking out some of the new online records. There's been an onslaught of new online records. Of course, we bring those to you every week. And so we'll be uh, digging into those. You've also got questions about working with other people's online family trees. We're going to talk about some hard to locate military records and getting lost in Pennsylvania research. So many of us here in the U.S. at some point end up in Pennsylvania doing some research. So and of course, the strategies that we're going to use here, we may be able to apply to other states and countries as well. Lots of great comments, questions and uh, inspirations from all of you coming up here shortly. I want to share with you a little bit of what's new with me. Let's see here. Well, I just got back from the Southern California genealogical jamboree that was in Burbank, California, always fun. One of the things that is new in print is over at Family Tree Magazine. So this came out, I'm looking at the May-June 2018 issue of Family Tree Magazine. And you'll notice it looks a little different. They have changed up their look, their colors, their font and, and logos. But they've also added a brand new column. And over on page eight, it's called Everything's Relative, Lisa's Picks. This column is so much fun to put together. And I've been wanting to do one with them for a while. I just had to kind of think of the right topic. And they came to me and said, I think we would just love to have you share some of your top picks. What is, you know, thrilling you lately in the world of genealogy, and maybe an opportunity to share some of the uh, things that I run across in my travels throughout the year. So this one is, well, it says here, springing into family history. Lisa Louise Cook's favorite family history books, tips, tools, and hotspots. And this was really fun to put together. So in this first issue, I share with you how I went to the Homestead National Monument in Beatrice, Nebraska. I did a seminar there, and it's a beautiful picture they've included. I also have one of my favorite app obsessions. I'm not going to tell you about it. You just have to go check it out because it does something very cool for genealogists. I also have a photo of me and my hubby. My hubby and I just celebrated our 34th anniversary last night. So uh, it's fun to see a picture of the two of us here. And we are at the Magnolia Market. Now, if you watch HGTV, you know what Magnolia Market is, right? It's Chip and Joanna Gaines's Uh, They're the fixer-upper couple. It's their place down in Waco, Texas, and they have a really kind of a cool new marketplace. It's almost like a little destination. And so I share a little bit about that. That, again, was on my way to a genealogy seminar that I was giving down in Southern Texas. I also am going to share a favorite book and also just a little view of what family history looks like at my house. So I hope you enjoyed this. This is a lot of fun. And we've already got a couple of more columns in the can. I just wrapped up my uh, most recent one, which will be in the October, November issue coming up. So anyway, check it out. It's a Family Trade magazine and it's Lisa's Picks. 
very fun. And oh, and and you know what? I was going to tell you about this. I almost forgot to tell you. In the first issue, my name is spelled wrong. Yep. Mm hmm. This happens. It's Lisa Lewis Cook. <laughs> if you look in the bottom left hand corner, there is my little headshot. And I, it says I'm the founder of Genealogy Gems, but they forgot the E on the end of Lewis. And it reminded me that errors in records are as dependable as death and taxes, right? It's going to happen. And even when we've known each other and worked together for 10 or 11 years, it can happen. I mean, typos happen. So just remember when you see those spelling variations on those documents that you're looking at, sometimes it's just the miss of the typewriter or uh, somebody got distracted because it doesn't mean that that's exactly how they were spelling their name that decade or that year, right? So, but that's okay. That was so fun. Poor Diane said, oh my gosh, I can't believe I spelled your name wrong. I'm like, hey, if that's the worst thing that happens this week, we're in good shape. All right. What else is coming up in the news here? Um, Oh, I wanted to share with you an article that I saw. Now, this was a Reuters article at dnaindia.com. Now, how did I end up at DNA India? Well, I have a Google alert for some of uh, the topics that interest me. And it sent me this article. And it's called Google Earth to let users post stories, photos in coming years, which of course, caught my attention because we've been doing that for years here, haven't we? Let me share this with you. This was written, it says here last summer. So this is the summer of 2017. And I'm not sure why it just popped up on my Google alerts, except to think that maybe they updated the article. But what's happening is Alphabet Inc. Now that may not sound familiar to you, but Alphabet Inc. is Google. Okay, that's their big parent company. Well, they want users to post millions of stories, videos and photos on its Google Earth platform in the next few years. And that's according to the Google Earth director, Rebecca Moore. Now, this article is reporting that she was speaking at a launch event in Brazil. It was actually showcasing um, a project that they were doing around the Amazon rainforest. But she was talking about Google Earth. And it says here, the Voyager tool, they're talking about Voyager in Google Earth for the Chrome browser. And I I talked about that here on the podcast. We have the Google Earth Pro software, which is a free download that you can use. And of course, I've been encouraging you to use that for genealogy for many years now and to create your own family history tours. And Voyager used to be in Google Earth Pro. So this may sound familiar to you that this was in the layers panel. And it was one of the options. It was kind of like little guided tours. Well, I'm not seeing Voyager anymore in Google Earth Pro. But when Google Earth for Chrome, the web browser, so we're talking a web based version of Google, you're not downloading this one. It is now spotlighting Voyager as kind of its big thing. So this to me looked like a kind of a relaunch of Voyager. So what did Voyager do? Well, it allows you to take interactive tours of really exotic destinations on Google Earth, on the Google Earth Chrome platform. And one of the ones they touted as very popular was the one with Jane Goodall, where she, of course, worked with apes and gorillas in her career. And it has photographs and maps and locations where she worked and what she did and the stories. And so it was really kind of cool. And what Rebecca Moore was saying was that Their goal is that in the future, just in the next year or two, and it may be sooner than later, you're going to be able to create your own unedited content for private or public use. And I suspected this because when Google Earth for Chrome, the web browser came out, it was clear that they were really reinvesting in Google Earth, but their moving away from the software, positioning the software as kind of the advanced users tool. I'm guessing that the thought was, some people just felt like it would be too techy to actually go and download the software and kind of work within this software program. So they have put it into a website, so that pretty much anybody can use it without having to do anything extra. And it made it more simple. And it also made it kind of more graphic. So there was lots of imagery and and it kind of moves you through the program that's much more fluid for the user and it's supposed to be I think simpler. 
So their idea is that you're going to be able to create your own stories in Google Earth on Chrome. Hmm. So it says regular users are going to be able to create their own unedited content. And it says for private or public use. So again, one of the cool things about what we've been doing in the last decade here at Genealogy Gems with Google Earth for genealogy is creating these family history stories and plotting out your research, telling the story in a really dynamic way with lots of media, but being able to do that still privately. So just because you put it together in a Google product doesn't mean it's instantly on the web where everybody and their brother can see it. And I like that I'm hearing that even though this will be a web-based product, which is already out there, Google Earth for Chrome, you're going to be able to create these and use them privately or make them publicly available. And it's really interesting, actually, that I came across this because Google contacted me last fall, I think it was. They were looking to kind of highlight companies and individuals who were doing innovative things with Google Earth. And so it was really cool because I'm not associated with them in any way. I don't even know that I was on their, I know I was not on their radar. And somehow I got on their radar and they spotted maybe something that I had done on YouTube or something. And they got in touch with me because they're putting together a video series highlighting people doing really innovative things with Google. And it was funny because one of their comments was, we never thought of family history at all, <laughs> anything to do with what we do here at Google. So they were really kind of intrigued by what we were doing. Now, so far, they have a zillion stories I'm sure they're looking at, and we haven't produced anything yet. Uh, and I don't know that we will. But it's been interesting to chat with them about what I do. But it's really interesting, because here's what Rebecca says at this event. She says, quote, the story of your family history, the story of your favorite hiking trip, it could be anything. It doesn't have to be profound. <laughs> and I thought, wow, okay, so now family history is on their radar. That is really cool. So they're encouraging people. And what better story to put into a geographic platform than your family history? Because your family is all about where they were located. That's such a key component of how we discover our family's history. So they have been focused so far in Voyager, basically working with, you know, famous folks, big companies, telling some of these stories, and many of them have been around issues, things like the Amazon rainforest and that type of thing. But I think what they really want to do is that they're kind of testing this out and then saying, hey, let's invite the general population to start telling their stories, which of course, I think is even better. And I like the way this article ended. She did say, quote, Google Earth is our gift to the world. In terms of budget, Google has nice revenue from advertising and not everything Google does has to make money, unquote. And that kind of answers a question that I get quite often from many of you. And that is, yeah, but if I invest my time and my energy building this tour and plotting out the research that I have so far and putting together a historic map collection and all these things you teach, how do I know, you know, Google's not going to disappear or that Google Earth isn't going to disappear specifically? And this really reconfirms what I've been understanding from everything that I've read about Google's approach to Google Earth. And that is that they acquired it many years ago. Uh, it used to be, you know, something you had to have government security clearance to use. It was, I think, used in the military or something. Once they acquired it, they started trying to make it more universal. They just feel like, you know, it's a product that certainly anybody around the world would want to use. And they're kind of seen it as their gift to the world, maybe something that they could just make available because it is so awesome. <laughs> it is. And I think going to the web platform and going to Google Earth for Chrome was a way to make it even more universally approachable. Because think of it this way, if you don't own your own desktop computer or your own laptop computer, then you couldn't take advantage of Google Earth. And while maybe here in the US, or if you're in the UK or Australia, or Canada, you know, most of us have computers. So that's not an issue. But around the world, that's not the case. But many, oh my gosh, I was, I don't even know what the number was. I think there's more mobile devices worldwide than there are people in the world. It's some, it's some kind of crazy number like that. I was just looking at that the other day. But the idea that if you have a mobile device, 
then maybe they could make Google Earth approachable and usable for you as well. And that's what Google Earth for Chrome does. And of course, around the same time that Google Earth for Chrome came out and really had this kind of new and exciting version available to all users, regardless of what device you were using, the app also went through a major renovation. So if it's been a while since you've used Google Earth, just know you've got lots of different options now and that it's here to stay, at least to the best of our knowledge. And um, you may very well be finding that some of the things that I've been teaching you how to do in the Google Earth Pro software will be starting to get built into the web version. So if you've been a little timid about trying your hand at the software, then know that this is coming down the road because this is really one of the best ways I have found in in all my years of doing this to really tell the most compelling story and also be able to truly visualize the data that you have been collecting in your research. Being able to visualize data all together in one complete view is a very, very powerful tool indeed. For more on this, you can head to the show notes and you will find information there about this article, my book, The Genealogist Google Toolbox, which of course has many chapters devoted to using Google Earth specifically. And we also have a video series that will teach you about using Google Earth. Also, I want to alert all of you premium members. When you sign into your premium e-learning membership and you go into premium videos in the menu, you're going to see, and and those of you who are not members, you can still kind of go in there and get a a bird's eye view of what this looks like. So there are many tiles there with different subjects. Click on geographic and you're going to find there several, oh my gosh, let's see here. There's six, seven videos focused on geographic research. And of course that includes time travel with Google Earth and the Google Earth for genealogy and finding best websites. We've got all kinds of great stuff and more on the way. So lots of resources there for you as well. And finally, uh, Sunny has got some news for you about one of the genealogy giants. Hello, everyone. It's Sunny Morton, contributing editor here at Genealogy Gems. I'm also your genealogy giants expert. I keep an eye on what's going on at Ancestry, Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And I help Lisa share their latest and greatest in our weekly Friday roundup of new records on the blog. Today, I wanted to shine the spotlight on a milestone recently reached by the free giant, Family Search. Quoting from their recent press release, In your quest to discover your family history, it might be time to take another look at Family Search's online offerings. The Genealogy Giant's free online databases of digitized historical documents have now surpassed 2 billion images of genealogy records, with millions more being added weekly from countries around the world. As a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping everyone discover their family history for free, Family Search prioritizes core genealogy records from around the world, like civil and church vital records, the ones that are foundational to identifying our ancestors and linking them together on our trees. Here are just a few of the Family Search record updates we've reported recently on the Genealogy Gems blog. In the United States, tons of vital records, remembering that in this country, you find these on the state or local level primarily. Recent updates I've noticed include New Hampshire vital and town records dating to the 1600s, more than a quarter million names in the interesting looking Iowa old age records, and another quarter million that have been added to their collection of Louisiana marriage records. Hopping the pond, Family Search has recently added more than a half million names in a collection of English parish records for the county of Devon. They've added more than 300 years worth of French church and civil records more than 5 million index names to German Catholic Church records, including 250 years just from the Rhineland, and for the Netherlands, civil registrations dating back to 1811. I know Lisa and I have both talked about this before, but it's crucial to remember that about 765 million of those 2 billion images, that's nearly 40% of them, are available only through the Family Search catalog. 
they're not fully listed out yet on the main search page. The catalog is the place where every day family search camera crews around the world dump the digital images they've just taken of whatever historical records they're working with. And back in Salt Lake City, it's the place where the staff at the Family History Library are putting all those freshly digitized microfilmed records they've been imaging. See the show notes for fresh instructions we just posted on the site for using the Family Search catalog, and a link to Lisa's interview with Diane Lucel at Family Search from several months ago. And I'll leave you with an invitation that Lisa usually gives, but I'd really like to add my voice to hers. We spend a couple of hours every week combing the giants and other websites for new genealogy record gems that might be helpful to you. So tell us when you find something in new records that you learned about from us. We love hearing about your successes and then sharing them in the podcast to inspire everyone else. In fact, I think Lisa has a success story for you in this episode. I'm Sunny Morton, and I'll talk to you later. Thank you so much, Sunny. All right, well, coming up next, we're going to hear from you, and that's in the mailbox. The folks at StoryWorth accomplished a staggering feat. They got my dad to tell me his stories. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of the show that this episode is brought to you by StoryWorth. And as you know, I only work with sponsors I genuinely believe in. Well, I've never known much about my dad's life. He, he's a man of few words, and that especially applies to stories about his life. So last year, I got him a StoryWorth subscription. And every week, they've emailed him a question about his life. And I got to see which questions were coming up. So I could have some input about which ones were to be asked and even write some of my own. As he replies to the emails, I've been receiving copies. He could also have recorded his answers by calling the StoryWorth telephone number if he didn't want to type it up on the computer. And his answers were short. That's just the way he communicates. But I have learned more about him in the past year than I probably have over my entire lifetime. As someone who cares about privacy and security, I really appreciate knowing it's only for us. StoryWorth always keeps us in control of who actually sees his stories. Now, a year later, we're ordering the keepsake hardcover book that comes with the subscription, and it compiles his answers into one volume, and we can upload pictures easily by email, on the web, or through their app. This is going to be a keepsake that gets passed on to my daughters and my grandchildren for sure. So this Father's Day, give your dad a gift that's for both of you. StoryWorth will give him a reason to spend time with his favorite memories and share them with you, giving you opportunities to become closer together, even if you live far away from each other. It's an easy and thoughtful Father's Day gift, even at the last minute. And you'll get $20 off when you subscribe when you visit storyworth.com slash Lisa. Again, $20 off, and you've got a gift that keeps on giving both to you and to dad. Visit storyworth.com slash Lisa. As I travel the world talking about genealogy, folks are always stopping me and asking for my advice on organizing and securing their family history research. And my standard answer is plant your family tree in your own backyard and share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard, it means keeping one master family tree in a software file right there on your own computer. That gives you ownership, control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. And of course, my software of choice and the one that I use is Roots Magic. I find that its tree building tools are second to none. And with Roots Magic web hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And now you have the ability to synchronize your Roots Magic database with your ancestry tree and get those ancestry.com web hints right there inside of Roots Magic. These are features that are really critical and they're exclusive to Roots Magic. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic and watch it grow. Get started at rootsmagic.com. Bring me a leper from 
my proud old dad, who knows that we are winning, and I bet he's glad, but more than any other, a line from my old mother. Bring me a letter from my hometown. Here in the mailbox, I got an email from Sarah, and she says, I just want to thank you for your weekly updates of new record sources. A couple of weeks ago, you sent a link for the Illinois State University newspaper archive. Being my dad's alma mater, I searched for him. A handful of stories came up about when my dad was almost kicked out of school and how his fellow students came to his rescue by staging a sit-in to prevent that. He'd had some minor infractions with a housing rule. I had forgotten that my dad had told me about it. I only wish he was still alive for me to share these articles with him. Thank you so much. Well, Sarah, you are so welcome. And Sarah's talking about, I believe she probably got the Genealogy Gems newsletter, which is our free weekly newsletter. Lacey puts that out on Thursday. And it's going to take you directly to all the latest blog posts, podcast episodes and videos. And of course, every Friday, we publish the new genealogy records that are available online and what's being published out there. So that's how she found it. And this is really probably our most popular post of the week usually is the new records post. So get that delivered straight to your inbox. You can do that by going to our homepage, genealogygems.com and clicking the red button at the top and you can get the free newsletter. From Doug, he says, weekly I get emails with family tree matches asking me to confirm the match. My problem is not with the matching, but with when I dig into their tree, the source for their information is another tree. Now that information may be a clue, but I learned way back that the info needed to be backed up by good primary and sometimes secondary sources, not what somebody thought was right. Info that I entered in my tree years ago and I found subsequently to be wrong is still hanging out in dozens of trees. What is your opinion? I cannot tell you how much I've learned and been entertained by genealogy gems over the last decade. Oh, thank you so much, Doug. Well, you have stated the problem accurately. (laughs) Trees are really clues, leads, right? They are not reliable sources. And we see them out there and we see that these misinformation is being passed around and we just have to kind of rest assured, this is not final say, this is just clues. And in those cases, they are wrong. For many people, another person's tree can provide a lead that eventually busts a brick wall, but not until they do their own research into the source documents, right? And you got to accurately cite the sources. Even the best of us make mistakes. And like you said, they can be perpetuated for ages to come, even when you fix the one in your tree. So that's why source citation, folks, is so important, because this provides us with what the original source was. How did we get to that conclusion? And like even when Doug said, when he found something and he needed to change it, you know, he could go back and take a look at his source and realize, oh, this needs another look and get it fixed. When we don't cite our sources, we don't know how we came to that conclusion. So it's really hard to unravel and correct. But you know, even with their imperfections, online trees really should not be overlooked. We just need to carefully verify them. And we need to think of them as lead generators, kind of clues, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Then we have to go and do the research ourselves. And of course, the other function that trees do, there's actually a couple of them now. One, they're tying into DNA. So it's certainly helpful when a match has a family tree, at least gives you a starting point. And also, it's in websites like Ancestry, that's a hint generator. So having a family tree on Ancestry.com is going to help them kind of match up the records and lead you to hints. But even then we are going to take that with a big grain of salt, because if the person in your tree is wrong, the hint is wrong, (laughs) right? So uh, it's a great reminder, Doug, that we all need to be citing our sources and really being cautious as we're looking at other people's trees, but not overlooking them completely, because 
you never know. I have found some really awesome stuff in other people's trees. And in the show notes, I will have a link to an article we did not too long ago. It was on reviewing tree hints at at Ancestry.com. And uh, we've got a new premium member who's getting back to her research. This was a message from Brenda on our Facebook page. And of course, you can find us at facebook.com slash genealogy gems. Oh, I hope you do. We do lots of fun stuff and get lots of great info out to you over there. So head over there and you can click like on the page and it will help you follow us. She says, I'm just getting back into my genealogy research after 10 years of not having time. We can all appreciate that. I got a premium membership to Genealogy Gems and also a MyHeritage subscription. It seems that research has completely changed to online work. I also had my DNA analyzed. Is most research done online now? I'm getting links to family lines so fast, but can I trust them? Can you tell me what sources to use? (laughs) I'm ordering your e-learning book too. Well, she's got some great questions. Welcome back, Brenda, first and foremost. Love having you back here in the genealogy world. And and that happens, life gets in the way, but it's always fun when you can get back to it. And of course, our whole purpose in life at Genealogy Gems is to help you navigate that abundance of information and get to the really good stuff, the gems. So of course, first, again, I really recommend subscribe to the free newsletter so you get the weekly updates and all that good stuff. Since you're getting back into genealogy, and it's been about 10 years, and since you're a premium member, sign in to your premium membership, head over to premium videos, and click organization, then I would really recommend that you watch Take Control of Your Family Tree. It's a it's a video that I did. And it's going to lay out a really easy to understand method that I recommend kind of a a holistic approach to working with your records and um, getting your systems kind of set up so that everything supports really well what you're going to be doing going forward. As for the family lines coming so fast, the best advice I can give you is don't let the links and the hints lead you. Okay, stick with solid genealogy methodology. And and I'm saying this to all of you, really, aren't I? Because even if you're not in her shoes, where you've kind of been out of it for 10 years, things do come fast. And so much is happening online. And it's really easy to start to abandon your good methodology, and just start reacting, right, to these objects that are kind of flying your way. But I'm really recommending you got to stay focused and stick to solid genealogical methodology. Okay, starting with yourself, working backwards, citing your sources, all those good mechanics that we learned from the very beginning. They're so important and they continue to be important even as we're moving forward into online data and sources and records. And unfortunately, I think because so much is coming so quickly, and that's a good thing, don't get me wrong, I would rather have too much than too little. And, and I would rather have it convenient at home on my computer. But because that's happening, that's also leading people, I mean, come on, let's be honest, they get a little sloppy. Sometimes you get a little excited, you forget to cite your source, you're moving too fast, you're not noticing the nuances in the records that you're seeing, and why maybe this doesn't actually add up. And so we're seeing more and more errors, this kind of goes back to Doug's question, right about family trees. So my best overall advice is set up good systems first, learn the proper methodology that will see you through regardless of whether you're working with online or offline records. And then take things with a grain of salt, as we said, citing our sources along the way when we do find something and we feel like this really proves our case. You know, even a digitized record that's hosted on a very reputable major website for genealogy, it can still have transcription errors. We know that can happen. So In the end, Brenda, there's no substitute for your brain, right? Trust yourself, trust your methodology, put in systems that in place that you can trust, and verify and document carefully as you go. That's still our mantra. Uh, And of course, we're really happy to be here with you every step of the way here at Genealogy Gems. If you really would like a refresher, and maybe those of you who are pretty new to genealogy, or those of you who feel like you just got a little off track for a while, okay, which happens, 
head to genealogygems.com and under podcast, you will find there is another show. It's called Family History Genealogy Made Easy. It's still there. I don't add to it. I'm not creating new episodes, but I think there's about 42, 46 episodes there. And this kind of starts with square one. And each episode teaches you as well as brings you some inspiring interviews with experts to support what, what it is we're teaching you. But it's basic good methodology and starts with square one and kind of moves your way back up your family tree, down your family tree, whichever way you're going on your family tree. That's what Family History Genealogy Made Easy can help you with. So check out that podcast. It's absolutely free and uh, is a great resource. We'll have all of these resources for you in the show notes. Amanda wrote in recently on our website. She says, hi, I have a research question for you or your military records expert. I know that you can access copies of draft registration cards online through FamilySearch, etc. However, I've been trying to figure out where the draft boards kept their records. I'm trying to figure out information like who was on a draft board? How did they operate? And are there records or press releases or other announcements they made? I haven't figured out if this is something that would have been absorbed by the selective service system or maybe county governments. If you have any ideas, I'd be grateful to hear them. So I checked in with our own Military Minutes man, Michael Strauss, and here was what he wrote me in response. Michael says, most of the information that is sought is found at the National Archives. Your listener didn't state whether this was a World War I or World War II or a later conflict like Korea. Each of the war periods will offer slightly varying information as each of the draft registrations fell under separate laws. World War I was under the Selective Service Act of 1917 and the latter under the Act of 1940. And still later, Selective Service Act of 1947. The earlier act falls into Record Group 163 of the National Archives, and the latter two fall under Record Group 147 at the National Archives. The men themselves filled out the separate cards for each war. The logistics of each of the draft boards, namely how they operated, who worked at the board, how inductees were given physicals, each draft was done on the local level, and these records are part of the individual record groups and part of the National Archives records. The best way to find this information is to locate a finding aid for each record group. The aid should tell specifics about what is available and corresponding years of records kept. Also, keep in mind that not all records will be located in Washington, D.C. Dependent upon location, the regional archives branches will very likely have their own records from the draft registrations in their own area. For example, Philadelphia, PA, National Archives branch will house records from Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and West Virginia. The National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis, Missouri will also be a place to check, as they will have many of the original Selective Service cards after World War II. For example, they have my dad's card when he filled it out in 1963. Thank you so much, Michael. And Michael told me that uh, he's going to be doing a bit more checking into this. So stay tuned here on the Genealogy Gems podcast. And as he finds more, he'll bring it to you here as part of Military Minutes. And of course, we'll have the highlights of, of his comments in the show notes. And remember, if you're listening on our Genealogy Gems app, the show notes, gosh, they're right there. <laughs> you tapped the episode to listen. If you tap details, you're going to see all of it is there, including links to all of the uh, websites that we mentioned. And of course, on your computer at our website, if you go to the actual page for this episode, you'll find all the show notes there as well. And if you're listening through the Genealogy Gems app, I want to alert you that we have bonus content for this episode. So go check it out. If you are an Android user, the app is free in Google Play. And for Windows and iPhone and iPad users, in the App Store at just $2.99. Coming up next, I've got an interview with my good friend Jim Beidler, who answers a listener's question. Bring me a letter from my proud old dad, who knows that we are winning, and I'll bet he's glad for more than any other. From 
Our sponsor for this episode is My Heritage, which has over 70 million members worldwide. If you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, My Heritage is the place that you want to be. Post your tree on My Heritage and start to see the magic as they automatically match it up with other trees, not just with genealogists in the country where you live, but around the world. Trees aren't primary sources, but they are excellent leads. I uploaded a portion of my family tree that contains my German heritage, and that's where I was really hoping to make a breakthrough, and very quickly it happened. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany. That was my first international cousin contact. But there's more at my heritage. Their unique and powerful search system, it's called Record Matches. It constantly calls over 5 billion historical records for your family. It's the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. It is also the first to translate names between languages. Find out what my heritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. Okay, have you visited Backblaze.com slash Lisa yet? If you don't have cloud backup for your computer yet, everything on it is vulnerable to loss. Your pictures, your master genealogy database, files for work, the everyday business of your household... Losing all of that at once is as devastating as it sounds. That's why I did my homework and I found a cloud-based backup service provider. I chose Backblaze. It runs in the background 24-7, automatically saving copies of everything, including my precious video files. Did you know that some of the other leading services actually skip your video files when they do the backup? Hello, not good. And Backblaze is so easy to use. I love their free app that allows me to access all my files if I need to from my smartphone or my tablet. Most importantly, the service is totally affordable for real people. It's just $5 a month. So don't wait to ensure that all your files are safe. Do it now. Back them up like I do with Backblaze. Head over to backblaze.com slash Lisa and get that $5 a month deal. Check it out for yourself. You could even do a free trial. That's backblaze.com slash Lisa. So one of the fun things about doing the podcast is I get to hear from you and your questions and your challenges. And our goal is to try to find some answers to that. And I heard from Tammy lately, and she had a question about some Pennsylvania research, and I knew who I was going to ask about this. Mr. James Beidler, who lives in Pennsylvania, correct? And you are certainly an expert on it. I know you're going to be teaching on Pennsylvania research at Jamboree coming up in a month or so. But here we are in Columbus, Ohio. Welcome, James. Yes. uh, Great to be here with you, Lisa. And uh, yes, I always like talking about my home state. Excellent. Well, how about this? Now, I'm just going to read this to you, and and I may end up even editing it if it's a little bit long. But when when Tammy first reached out to me, she kind of said, oh, I've got a brick wall. Do you have any idea for strategies? And, And of course, my first reaction is always, I will have ideas or I'll know who to ask. But we have to really formulate the question and we have to know where we've been right? Before we know, we don't want to um, kind of cover the same territory. So Tammy says, I had a full membership on Ancestry for a year, and I searched for number 14 and number 15, my husband's great-great-grandparents. Now, his name is Andrew Kaufman from Pennsylvania. Hers is Sarah, maiden name unknown from Maryland. They have lived in Iowa, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. The last place I found them was in Pinnerock, Ogle County, Illinois, on the 1870 census. And this one says Andrew was from Pennsylvania and Sarah was also. Oh, so now we're getting that conflicting info. He was 70 and she was 67, and the others said that she was from Maryland. So going back on the 1860 census, they were in the town of Rockvale, Ogle County, Illinois. And she gives the page numbers and line numbers. He was 59, she was 54. Going back to 1850, 
the schedule, and she says, free inhabitants. They were in Mad River Township. Oh, what a name. Mad River Township in Montgomery County of Ohio, where we are today. Of course, the entire family is lined out. I'm not sure who Elizabeth Dillinger is. Uh, she's in the family household. Andrew was approximately 49. Sarah was 48. Now, family lore says these three brothers came from the Netherlands, and there was a fight, and two brothers stayed close, and one disappeared. We found a story about this, but couldn't link them to our ancestors. We were also told that they were Mennonites. Now, during our trip to Pennsylvania, we visited the Lancaster Mennonite Historical Society with no luck. We went to the Susquehanna, am I saying that correctly? Susquehanna. Susquehanna County Historical Society in Montrose, Pennsylvania with no luck. We followed a lead that took us to Franklin, Pennsylvania and Brooklyn, Pennsylvania, and we didn't find them there either. I've also searched Family Search, and I didn't find anything more. We found all our other family graves between Iowa and Illinois, but we can't find Andrew and Sarah. In 1850, they had three daughters, Margaret, Elizabeth, and Susan. They had two sons, Absalom and James. James is the one who's the great-great-grandfather of her husband. I've considered getting a membership on MyHeritage or Find My Past, but I don't have the money to do both. And before our trip to Pennsylvania this summer, I'd like to find the best places to continue our search. So she's thanking us in advance to hopefully get some good ideas and ways to make the most of the trip she's going to make out there. What say you? <laughs> well, I've, I've gotten this type of inquiry so many times that I created a lecture that I've given a few times called Tackling the all I know is born in Pennsylvania problem. <laughs> I have a feeling that's very common. <laughs> it is, uh, and and especially uh, here where we're at in Ohio, there are so many people, uh, especially in the 1850 census, the first census, where you get birthplace information, where so, so many people in Ohio throughout the Midwest list PA or PENA, as it's sometimes <laughs> abbreviated, as their uh, their place of birth. Several several ways that uh, I recommend people attacking this, and it's it's basically it's trying to winnow down from just Pennsylvania and any of Pennsylvania's sixty seven counties to a smaller number of counties. I mean, this is and of course this you know this is what we do in genealogy an awful lot of times is we either try to make the haystack smaller or the needle stick out bigger. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, some some techniques on this. One thing is uh, from the 1850 and succeeding censuses, if there are children in the household, see where where the the births are of those of those children, and when was the last one born in Pennsylvania? That may may help you narrow down other records. Now, what other what other records should we be talking about? Exactly. Well, one one matter of fact, that I lectured about this morning are tax lists. Pennsylvania has a pretty good survival of its tax lists that were kept. They were they were taxed by in colonial times and post colonial times, both by Pennsylvania's estate and and by its counties. But they kept them organized by the township level, which is the lower really? uh, municipal level. Okay. Yeah, and so so if you then can narrow it down to a township, you're you're going to find records. But the the first the first thing I do, you know, after you say, you know, the last child that's born in Pennsylvania is 1838. Well, then look at the 1840 census and see which counties this surname appears in. Now, with a name like Kaufman, uh, is a pretty common, uh, pretty common German name. So. You know, that might not be too uh, too terribly useful. Now, if they had one that was more unique, what are you talking about then going specifically into that collection for the 1840 census and just running the surname, not anything else? You're not right. You're just trying to get a good ballpark feel for yes, the because because you may, if it, if it is a, a less common surname, then you may only have four counties, say, that that surname appears in, and then oh. you'll concentrate on those counties' records looking at church records, looking at estate records, deeds, okay. and so forth. A bingo moment of being able to, to find it is when they first move out of Pennsylvania, if they buy land fairly soon afterwards, 
then they usually will still list their former residents in identifying themselves in the deed. Mm-hmm. You know, Jacob Kaufman of Burn Township, Berks County, Pennsylvania, you know, late of Bur- Bur- yes. Burn Township, Berks County, Pennsylvania, but now of Richland County, Ohio. So, you know, so that's, you know, like I said, that's a bingo, bingo moment. We don't all, aren't all living right enough to uh, to get that for us. So. <laughs> that doesn't happen every time. Yeah. And you're mentioning, actually, you've mentioned two you record collections that I'm thinking of new genealogists, genealogists who've pretty much been in the online phase, but not prior to that. Mm. And you mentioned taxes Mm -hmm. and you mentioned land. Mm -hmm. And those aren't the two that we're running into as often. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hear tax and I want to walk the other direction because it's like, (laughs) it just sounds scary. So give us a really quick description. What a tax record, you mentioned it briefly about who was taxing state and local. What kind of info is going to be on there? And yeah. what do you turn to to find the tax records? Mm-hmm. Okay. As far as what information is on them, it's the name of the person being taxed and usually a quantity of land that they have if they're a landowner. And up until the 1840s in Pennsylvania, they also tax certain personal property like horned cattle, horses, so yeah, if they were like renting, mm-hmm. if, they, if they were leasing or something, they didn't have to own property be, to be on tax records because if you had other types of property, you could still be on it? If you had a certain amount of personal property, okay. certain amount of value, then yes, you were taxed. Good. Yes, And, they're, and they, they usually call those lists... The list of inmates, you know, which, 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 of course, people, think, oh, my ancestor was in jail. No, it means they were a renter with a certain amount of personal property subject to tax. So that's what's what's on the list as far as far as accessing them from the colonial times. Uh, they were during the colonial times. Those lists have been uh, put in the published Pennsylvania Archives series of books which are a free item on fold3.com. Oh. Yeah. You don't even have, you, so you go to Fold3, but you don't have to have you a paid subscription. You don't have to have a paid subscription. Very nice. Yeah. That was a deal that the Pennsylvania State Archives worked out with them. They, they wanted to digitize them. They said, yeah, you can, but you got to keep it free. And then the later ones mostly are on the, the county level in the tax assessment office. A lot of them have been microfilmed by the Pennsylvania State Archives, and those microfilms <laughs> would be at the Pennsylvania State Archives in Harrisburg. So that's as far or as far as at accessing them. Instead of a, this, the U.S. Census, a, a once a decade snapshot, these are a once a, once a year snapshot mm-hmm. because they were, were generally taken every year. In some eras, every three years they would reassess. You know, so, so three years will look very similar and then they would reassess you know, and, and uh, you know, change the values and so forth. Right. Another um, good record set are our uh, church records, especially of baptisms. And uh, those have been put together by the the late John Humphrey uh, in his series, Pennsylvania Births. They're a database on on ancestry. They're also available in in book forms in uh, libraries that have a a decent Pennsylvania collection. These are alphabetized lists, mostly taken from baptisms, and it covers all of the 20 counties of southeastern Pennsylvania. That's a good kind of one-stop shopping for trying to find people born in Pennsylvania. You know, there are baptismal books for churches outside of that that area if they came from a different part of Pennsylvania. That's a little bit more catch-as-catch-can. Uh, there are usually uh, transcriptions uh, and in um, county historical societies, but that's going to require going from one to another. And that's why, you know, I'm recommending first try to drill it down, just one county ideally, mm-hmm. or, or three or four, you know, that, to then concentrate on those, uh, those counties' records. So Tammy is going to go in person. Mm-hmm. And what kinds of things are the kinds of things that you really got to be there in person to get the most of it? And is the state archives a good place to go in addition to the county historical society? Yeah, the, the, state, the state archives and also our uh, state library of Pennsylvania, both of them are in Harrisburg. And, you know, if you, especially if you haven't 
established a particular county before you go, they would be a good place to start at because they're both right in Harrisburg. State Library mostly deals with published works, including transcriptions of church records. And from they have at least some, th- some things from all counties of Pennsylvania. So they would be a kind of a home base to start. And then based on anything you, you find there, then go to those counties where, where you found the leads. Is there a good card catalog? Can she do a lot of her prep before she walks in the door, having kind of scoured what they've got available? Yes, there, to ask for. yes there's an online catalog for the State Library of Pennsylvania, the State Archives. Now, they're, they're dealing with, uh, with original records mm-hmm. uh, for the most part, and government records in particular, although they, they do have, you know, like some business records. They have cataloging to the extent of, especially their manuscript group collections, that it'll go down to the container level and say, you know, that there there are letters from so and so to so and so, things like that. Now they won't give the names in that letters, but you you might find a manuscript group that uh, that relates to a particular family. At least you can walk in the door and be armed with some of that. Yes, yeah. And you gave us some great background on the taxes and how about land records because you you talked about that too. Yeah, land land records on the. The, well, there's the theory and there's the reality always. <laughs> the, the theory is that the first transaction is on the state level. During oh. colonial times, from the Penn family that owned Pennsylvania's proprietors to, to individuals, after that from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to private individuals. And you were supposed to first take out a warrant, which in this context... The warrant is 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 just a preliminary application, so to say. Uh, that warrant in, to purchase land. To purchase land. That warrant then gave you the right to survey the land. You know, mark off, map it. You know how how many acres exactly you uh, were going to purchase, and then the final step was a patent which, in, again, in this context, is the first title to, to land. Mm-hmm. So that was all supposed to happen in sequence on the state level. And then buying and selling after that would be recorded on the county level in the county recorder of deeds offices. Okay, that's all the theory. The theory. Now let's deal with reality. What happened in a good number of instances is uh, someone would take out the warrant maybe do the survey step. They wouldn't go through with patenting it because, of course, they're going to have to pay a fee to, to, right. uh, to patent it. So what you have a lot of times is warrant, survey, both on the state level. Then you may have one or many land transactions on the county level going deed to deed to deed. And then finally, at some point, a couple times in its history, Pennsylvania did patent sweeps where they went across the countryside, and if you if you were living on unpatented land, guess what? The game of musical chairs stopped, and you had uh-huh. you were the one who had to had to pay the patent fee. So that that happens a lot, where you have some records on the state level chronologically, then a lot on the county level, and then a final one back on the on the state level. We also have a problem that it's estimated that about a quarter to the third of the land transactions. Their deeds went unrecorded, the oh. 1700s and 1800s, right. which creates holes in the in the uh, the deed chains. There are other resources to to try to get around it, including using the deeds of adjoining property owners to determine who was in the property at a particular time. Interesting. There's the theory. There's the description that you read. And let's say if you're looking at an ancestry database and you read that description, but that's just if if all else is perfect. And why? Even experts check with other experts, right? We can't all be experts. And knowing the real behind the scenes, how did it actually play out? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, because uh, otherwise you can have expectations that mm-hmm. just aren't going to be fulfilled. <laughs> or stop short and not realize there was somewhere else to look. At, yes. Because you know, there yes. was a little deviation there. Okay, so we did the tax records and the land records. Anything else? Any other suggestions for her? Particularly in the idea that she wants to go in person and make more hay of it the other thing would uh, would be estate files because if the uh, Kaufman family was already in Ohio when the father of Mr. Kaufman had died in Pennsylvania you know they there would probably be some sort of sign off 
showing that you know so-and-so from Ohio has signed off. So that may be a way of connecting him to the Pennsylvania family. These estates are on the county level. However, uh, there's a, a big collection that has now been indexed of them that's available both on Family Search and Ancestry. Oh, okay. Of the, I, I think it's about 60 of the, of the Pennsylvania counties are uh, their their estate records are uh, digital and searchable you mentioned family search that's a great place to go that family search wiki you know if you know which mm-hmm. county you're working with they have so many specific kinds of um, suggestions there as well well we always love having you here and i know last time we talked to you it was all about german research and of course they can read more about that the german research on the genealogy gems blog thank you so much jim it's always wonderful to have you you're welcome lisa Thanks for joining me for this episode, number 218. And thank you to everybody who helped bring this all together for you. All my peeps here, we've got Sonny Morton, the contributing editor, and Michael Strauss, as well as Hannah Fullerton, who edited this audio. And of course, Lacey Cook keeps us all organized. And a big thank you and a happy anniversary to my husband, Bill. As I mentioned to you before, last night we went out for our 34th anniversary And the waitress said to me, oh my gosh, what's the key to your success? And it was very simple and easy to answer because it was something that a very wise woman once told me, and that is, choose wisely and then treat kindly. You know, as a young girl, I grew up in a very small family, and it wasn't a very stable family. And as I've told, I think, many of you before, my parents divorced when I was 13, and And throughout my teenage years, each of them divorced again. So I'd I'd been through a lot of uh, instability in my family life. And that's why I want to give a really big thank you to my wonderful husband, Bill, publicly, because he gave me a second chance at a very stable family life. And I have three wonderful daughters and three amazing grandchildren to thank him for. And thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.